Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Prescription, the Tax Policy Center's bi-weekly webcast on fiscal policy. This is one of a series of conversations with state, local, and federal government officials, as well as leading economists and other experts. I'm your host, Howard Gleckman, a senior fellow at TPC and editor of our blog, TaxFox. My guest today is Liz Farmer, a research fellow at the Rockefeller Institute and a consultant at Funkhauer and Associates. She publishes a weekly fiscal policy newsletter, Long Story Short, and also writes regularly for Forbes and Route 50. Before we begin, our usual bit of housekeeping. We encourage audience members to submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of our screen. The event is being recorded and will be posted online at TPC's website. We're using captioning, which you can adjust or turn off with the live transcript button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you'd like to join the conversation on social media, please use the hashtag live at urban. And if you'd like to suggest a future guest for the prescription, just email us at info at taxpolicycenter.org. Liz Farmer, welcome to the prescription. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. So at the end of January, we reported that state and local governments had lost one and a half million workers at the start of the pandemic. And that still there are more than 900,000 fewer state and local workers than two years ago. So what happened? Well, um, you know, a lot of that was initially layoffs and then people quitting because they were either uh, because they didn't want to work during a pandemic or, or other stressors. We saw a lot of people just leave the labor market, particularly women. What has happened since then, particularly since late 2020, early 2021, is that workers started coming back to a certain degree. And a lot of what we're talking about is primarily in local government. Um, the state, state local jobs, sorry, state jobs slipped as well, but they have to largely rebounded or close to rebounded. What's happened with local government is they start, those jobs started to come back and then they started come falling down again uh, as more people were leaving. And this started kind of around springtime in 2021. So worse for cities and counties than for states. What about occupations? What, what do we know about which occupations suffered the most and which are doing relatively well? Yeah, so it's it's hard to say, you know, for sure, but anecdotally, a lot of what's driving this is people in education and people in law enforcement. Um, there's been a couple of surveys out over the last year. One was just recently by the National Education Association, and it found that a little over half of teachers are plan or of educators, I should say, are planning on leaving the profession earlier than they expected. Um, with law enforcement, there was a survey done uh, in mid-2021, and in that case, uh, people were, law enforcement reported a 45% incre increase in retirements over the last year and an 18% increase in resignations. And just given kind of, you know, what we're hearing and what you think about logically with the pandemic, I would say other than healthcare workers, those two professions have just brutally been on the front lines. And, uh, and with law enforcement, you, you add in just like the negative national narrative as well around police that has been occurring, you know, kind of on, on, a, on a high level over the last couple of years. Um, you know, th those two professions anecdotally are what, where we're seeing a lot of this. And overall, it's just, it's pandemic fatigue across the board. So let's, let's talk generally first and they'll get more specific about education and law enforcement. So generally you talked about why people left. What do we know about why they're not coming back? Is it non-competitive pay? Is it working conditions? Is it still COVID? Mm. Is it still parents who can't get care for their children? Uh, or, or has kind of the great resignation come to the school districts? Yeah, I think it's, it's all of the above. <laughs> Um, I will say that if, um, you know, if you were to look at what the biggest drivers are in, in education, yes, it's certainly salaries. We, we've, you know, there's been a teacher shortage in, I mean, probably just about everywhere, depending on who you talk to, but there have been places that were already struggling to hire teachers. And that was largely because of pay. 
Um, you know, one example from way before the pandemic is Oklahoma. They that state's teacher crisis was largely based on pay, and they were losing teachers to Texas. Uh, who were living in Oklahoma and driving to Texas to work because they could earn that much more money uh, teaching. And so this is not necessarily a new issue, but then when you factor in all of the stress that teachers have gone on, gone through uh, in the pandemic, those who are of retirement age are, are leaving and those who were, you know, who are younger are thinking, you know what, maybe I don't wanna stick this out. The pension benefits aren't as great as they once were. Um, you know, a lot of places, a lot of folks who've come on in the last five to 10 years as a public employee aren't getting that super secure, safe pension benefit that their predecessors did. And so that's less motivation to stay. That, of course, those super secure pensions were not necessarily funded. So it's not clear how secure they really were. But <laughs> <I'll let you laughs> <tell you>. Right. <laughs> So you've been talking about teachers, but I, I let, let, let's sort of pick that apart, too. I think it's interesting. Um, my understanding is it's also everything from cafeteria workers to bus drivers to superintendents. Yeah, very true. Very true. And actually, that's that's, you know, where you saw that dive down in local government employment and in the education sector. It, yeah, it was bus drivers. A lot of the, the um, kind of support staff for schools, those are the ones who didn't have jobs who left immediately during the pandemic or you know were laid off um and then they have started to come back but I, I, you know i i can only theorize over why it's so difficult to to staff back up on that level but you know just logically th those are the lower paying paid positions they are typically not full time especially if you look at bus drivers and yet they take on all of the same you know health risks that you know any frontline worker does and for less money and less job security because they were the first to go um and so you kind of look at that and think it's not worth it maybe i can maybe these folks are looking at the private sector they don't want to come back or for whatever reason you know they're not just they're waiting to return to the workforce you know it could be any number of reasons but and one and again and this is true for the private sector too you know lower paid less job security and they tend and people in those positions also tend to be um, more have more health um, vulnerability to COVID. Uh, you know, it just statistically speaking, lower income, if you're a person of color, that particular population has seen way more adverse effects from contracting COVID-19, contracting coronavirus. So all of those things kind of roll together. It makes sense why those particular positions are really hard to get back. So there's some discussion that one reason why people were slow coming back to work was because they had savings that they had generated from mm -hmm. the economic impact payments and the child tax credit payments and all the rest of it. And I guess one of the interesting questions is, are they burning through that savings? And, and do you expect to see people now beginning to come back? Also, the fact that schools are now largely reopened, uh, the problem of parents not having anybody to care for their kids during the day has been resolved. So do you think that some of that is going to take care of itself over the next few months? I would think so, just, just as a guess. Um, you know, looking at what was done with those pandemic, those impact payments, if you're, you know, lower income folks, they that money was money that they needed and they spent it on vital things like housing, like paying utility bills, um, that sort of thing. And then, you know, if you're slightly at, you know, the next level up, maybe those the, uh, there was evidence that a lot of people did kind of put that money away towards savings. So it's, it's hard to say, um, you know, we're not getting those impact payments anymore, but there still are programs to help people with utility, with rent, uh, mortgage payments, all of that stuff. So perhaps if, if those programs are still around, um, you know, it, it may be viable for if you're lower income to kind of wait a little bit longer to get back in the labor market. Um, or, you know, uh, this is, I'm just, you know, theorizing here, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say in terms of whether those jobs will come back. School systems may also be in particular with those kinds of jobs, just reshuffling staff, redeploying people to, to fill those positions as needed and may ultimately decide, you know what, we can operate with fewer, fewer people. So it's really hard to say, and there's a lot of possibilities. 
what, what do we know about the more senior positions? Um, you know, think about superintendents and principals, and especially the last couple of months, it seems like many of them are caught kind of between increasingly aggressive parents on both sides of the political divide. And I wonder how that's affected retention. Do we, I know we just probably mostly have anecdotes, but what do we know about that? Yeah, um, you know, as a parent <laughs> with a kid in public schools, you know, just observing, <laughs> you know, absolutely, that's, that's been a big, a huge head. I, I wouldn't want to be a school principal right now, quite frankly. Um, you know, I think about my son's teacher and all the support staff there. And I, as a parent, I want to do whatever it is I can to, to make their days go a little bit easier because you're right. They are dealing with a lot of, you know, pro, a lot of stuff that they didn't sign up for. And, and that could be true of every profession uh, that's, that's on the front lines in the pandemic. But we're talking about a profession here that already had a lot of stresses prior to the pandemic. Um, and so in terms of those higher level staff, um, with the education system, I'm not so sure we're actually seeing that in the numbers yet. But when we're talking about other public sector employees, I think we, anecdotally, I hear that a lot of those kind of upper management positions are the ones, you know, who was maybe not the CFO, but the deck deputy CFO of a, of a city or county, <clears throat> you know, they're of retirement age, they have a lot of experience, maybe they're in line to take the CFO position when the CFO leaves, but they decide, you know what, I'm going to, I've got better things to do, I've got my retirement secure, I'm going to go travel or see the grandkids and whatever. So it's those upper positions that that are also leaving uh, in, in other parts of, of local government. And that's a real concern because it creates this, this pipeline issue. There's already been a lack of bench depth with local government. You've got a lot, you know, some young people, a lot of older people, but no one in between to kind of fill up that pipeline in a nice steady way. I want to ask you about this retirement issue in a couple of minutes, but one last issue about, about teachers and actually frontline workers of all kind, including the law enforcement. What about the mask and vaccine mandates? Is there any evidence that that added much to the loss of public employees? There was a lot of publicity, a lot of stories about people threatening to leave. Did people actually leave? Yeah, there was a lot of threatening to leave. Um, I think we're kind of still waiting for that to shake out. I do know that when when I last spoke with Seattle, for example, which implemented with its uh, it had its deadline a bit earlier than a lot of other places for to be vaccinated uh, or to show proof of at least a first shot. And in in that city, yes, there was a number of resign of um, uh, quits or retirements anecdotally related to that. And then when I last spoke with the CFO, he said they're just now starting to work through the people they're gonna have to lay off essentially or, or separate um, or ask to retire or whatever it is. Um, so I think that's something that we'll start to see in the coming months. New York City, for example, had about 1% of its workforce on leave due to not complying. So, you know, whether or not they can get an exemption or whether or not they're just going to be asked to leave that still has yet to happen but it, it certainly is a bit of a factor so we've been we've been talking generally about about the trend around the country have you seen much variation are there some cities and states that are filling jobs more rapidly than others do, what do we know about that yeah it's um you know i was looking at the data and it primarily in the north sorry, in the Northeast and the Southeast, actually, uh, kind of New England states and then Southeast, those are the ones that are seeing more rates, higher rates of separation um, with the latest numbers. And this is, I think, as of November or December, um, Georgia is actually a state that is seeing a high rate of separations. And when I did some looking around, there was a Georgia labor report that mostly focused on Atlanta and uh, the government was, you know, along with le leisure and hospitality, government was the big driver of separations in that state, and then, and primarily in Atlanta. And what was interesting to me, this kind of goes back to what I was saying at the beginning about the difference between state level and local level employment, government, state and local government employment as a whole in Atlanta was pretty flat, but broken out into the different levels. 
um, state government was actually up, federal and state government had actually gained a bit since February, 2020, but local government in Atlanta was 7,500 jobs down from 20, from February, 2020 through December of last year. Um, so that's, you know, kind of one example in one state, but seeing a high rate of separations. Um, but, you know, and other states that have higher rates are Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and New England. Um, and then also there's that corner like Montana, Wyoming, um, North Dakota, they're also seeing a higher rate of separations and that's employment overall. Um, I wasn't able to get the state local, recent state local numbers from there. But um, interestingly, where we saw the places where we saw the pandemic really start spreading first, California, New York, those are places that have among, among the lowest rate of separations right now. So it, it could be, um, yeah, it, it could be because, well, I mean, those places have always had a lot of jobs. <laughs> so there's, you know, opportunities galore. Um, yeah, but I thought that was an interesting piece as well. Yeah, so this sounds like it's not a red state, blue state thing. There's a, there's, there seems to be no, no. no pattern there. Yeah, not at all, not at all. Interesting. So one of the issues that you identified early on was was pay. Um, mm -hmm. In 2020 and 2021, Congress enacted a succession of pandemic relief bills. They sent hundreds of billions of dollars to state local governments. So for, first, I think to, to help the, our, our audience, can you describe what the funding was like and where it went just to kind of set a baseline for people? Yeah, sure. So with the CARES Act, um, that created the Coronavirus Fiscal Relief Fund. I'm probably getting the order of those words wrong, but that was direct aid to large, to every state, and then large uh, local governments across the United States. And the cap, I guess the cutoff was you had to have a population of 500,000 or higher to receive direct money. Uh, if you had a smaller population, which is basically most localities, most counties and cities and towns in the country, uh, you had to wait and see if your state was gonna, or county was gonna divvy up some of what it got to you. And so because of the issues with, with that, I mean, thinking about how that excluded most counties in the country who, which operate hospitals, healthcare departments, <laughs> law enforcement offices. Um, when ARPA, the American Rescue Plan um, Act came along, that um, more than doubled the direct funding to 350 billion. And that went directly to every government entity, every, every town, county, city, uh, and state across the country. And so that was a huge, huge difference. And primarily the CARES money went towards responding to the pandemic, a lot of one-time stuff with you know, PPE equipment, putting up plexiglass, uh, a lot went to payroll, a lot went to um, healthcare stuff. And then with the American Rescue Plan funds, some of that is now starting to be spent. And most of it currently is going to revenue replacement for places that still have revenue loss and also healthcare expenses. But what you're seeing with that is because it is so much money and it's going directly to every, like I said, every government local, uh, entity, um, cities, are looking to are able to plan ahead and hopefully reserve some of that money for kind of long term investment. The federal government really, really, really wants governments to invest that money in an equitable way that lifts up the the populations that have suffered most from the pandemic, which are also populations that have over, that were already disadvantaged prior to the pandemic. So that type of long-term kind of forward-looking spending, we're not necessarily seeing this instant, but we're starting to see what places plans are for that type of spending. So it's interesting that a lot of states at least are using the money to cut taxes. They're, you know, they weren't supposed to, but, <laughs> but they are. <laughs> Yeah, they would say they're not using the money to do that because technically they can't, right? right. But, but what's happening get, is they're yeah, the money a lot of and people, they're cutting taxes. Let's put it like that, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Because they're not spending that money on right. cutting taxes. But what's happening is their their budgets are doing really well, right? Like income tax revenue and sales tax revenue, which both went way down at the beginning of the pandemic, those bounced up and they are doing just fine for the most part. Um, I would say for every part. So, and that's what states rely on 
most for their for their tax tax revenue and so because of that states are seeing surpluses and they're getting this federal money so they're able to say well we have the surplus we're using that to cut our taxes not the federal money over here right but the bottom line is it sounds like a lot of this money has yet to trickle down to say teacher pay or police officer pay or something like that yeah, I've seen there's been a lot of cases where governments have um, used either their CARES money or plan on using their American Rescue Plan money for one time bonuses. Mm -hmm. um, they have used it for ongoing payroll, but I think, um, you know, the concern with that is you, you can use the American Rescue Plan money to increase pay. You can use it to hire more employees than you had at the beginning of the pandemic. But I, I think. And, and hopefully, you know, I, I, I personally would like to see public employees earn more money because we rely on them so much. However, I don't want to see governments using one-time funds for recurring expenses because then that, of course, sets them up to be, you know, they're left hold, holding, holding the bag after the, the federal money runs out. So I haven't heard as much of, of that particular use. I have seen governments hiring people to manage recovery funds, but those are, that's like a short-term, you know, sunsetted position. Mm -hmm. So I want to take you back to an issue we're talking about before. I got an interesting question from a member of the audience about mandates and says, as mandates end, how will this affect unvaccinated public workers? Will they still be fired? Interesting question. It is an interesting question um, and not one that I'm legally <laughs> qualified to answer. I'm actually talking to someone about that in a couple of weeks because I've had, you know, just a couple of questions about that. Um, you know, ultimately, ultimately, it is a government, a local government's entity right to require that their employees be vaccinated or, you know, whatever it is. Um, employer, private employers are doing that. Um, you know, schools, I think a big, a big question that's, that has yet to be answered is what school systems are going to do, both for, you know, not just teachers, but of course, children, like our children have to be in order to go to public schools have to have XYZ number of vaccinations. I do want, you know, we haven't answered the question yet about whether that's going to include a coronavirus vaccine. And I imagine it won't be answered for several more years because this virus keeps changing every several months and the information keeps changing. But yeah. it, it is a good question. So I, I want to uh, focus a little bit on the R word that you've used several times in this conversation, retirements. Uh, it, it seems like this was a problem before COVID uh, and, it, mm -hmm. and it's now just accelerating. So give us a sense, if you can, about maybe give us some numbers about the percentage of people who are retiring and what the consequences of that are going to be for, for state and local government. Yeah, um, I do have numbers here. So the retirements were on kind of a slow and steady burn um, before the pandemic. It was rising. And um, I don't think I have the... So the... In the third quarter of 2021, retirements accounted for about a little over 15% of all the, the separations. Um, and that's a huge, huge jump. I think it was around half that, around half that mark, um, or maybe even a little bit higher in the years before. But what what's happened is retirements have, have jumped up and, uh, you know, like the, the pandemic accelerated a lot of trends, work from home, uh, you know, all of this stuff. Um, but retirements is, I think, particularly an issue with, with state and local governments because of those guaranteed pensions. So you have this huge number of people retiring and the, the inability to fill those positions immediately leaves governments in this place where they have fewer employees whose paychecks are helping contribute to that pension system, as well as the government's own con contribution. And now you have you know, what was like a rising number of people who are retiring, you know, jumping up. So now your retirement, your pension benefit, your pension payments are going to be notably higher. You're not getting the same influx from your current employees payments. And so governments may end up looking at higher pension bills, even with the fact that the stock market has the pension pensions overall have actually gained a little bit of ground in the last year. So I think that's you know, I mean, actuaries have a job to do with all of that. <laughs> For sure. 
So mm -hmm. I wonder how much of this that you've been describing here is a more fundamental problem. It used to be that public service work was considered an important, highly respected thing to do. Now we seem mm -hmm. to see that government is in really kind of bad odor. You know, it's a popular thing to hate government, to think the government's out to get you. It, and on a secular basis, beyond COVID, beyond all that, you have the sense that, that people just don't want government jobs anymore. They, they all things equal, they'd, they'd rather be working in the private sector. Is that part of what's happening here? To some degree, I think. Um, I'm not sure it's that they don't, you know, I don't want to work in government, but I think they just don't want to make a career out of it. And I think that's that's the big difference. You know, millennials and whatever the name is of the younger generation, I can't keep track. You know, um, the, the trends have shown that they are more prone to stay in a job for a few years and then go try another one. And government career, you know, employees are there for 25 years, 30 years. And that's not something the younger generation is doing. I think government is still very appealing because the younger generation also really wants jobs that are fulfilling and meaningful. And that's like the definition of a lot of government jobs. Um, you are literally making a difference for everyone around you. Um, and so I think what we're going to see is just shorter terms of employment, but, and that's a turnover issue. I mean, governments need to do something about how to, how to manage that, how to have, how to groom people to stay, but also acknowledge that you're not going to have as many career employees as you used to have. But I will say, I know we're almost up with time that while national tr trust in the national government has eroded, the trust in local government has stayed pretty steady. And, and it even went up a little bit in the early days of the pandemic because of you know, all of the, the responses that people saw their local government doing. Interesting. So we do have just a minute left. What can state and local governments do about this? What can they do to make public service, state and local government work more attractive to people? I think um, they need to make it appear, need to make the jobs appear more like what private the private sector offers, both in terms of compensation but also in terms of technology and flexibility. Uh, governments have an opportunity to invest in new tech systems that can really bring them up to speed. Uh, you know, I mean, instead of operating on really old systems and, and stone age type stuff at this point, you know, that lead, that's frustrating for employees, much less for constituents who are trying to get anything done with government. So, you know, just, I, I, we hear all the time, but I mean, modernizing and then, in, may be more flexible in terms of what you can offer your employees, you know, flexible work hours, work from home, childcare. I mean, really kind of take a holistic view of what you can offer your employees to get them to stay. Great. Well, Liz Farmer, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. It's been a real pleasure. I've learned a lot. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for having me. It was fun. And thanks to our audience.